Eliana, feel free to introduce yourself. Nice. So thank you, Laser. Um, well, I'm Eliana Campos. Um, I was originally a graphic designer in Peru. I transitioned slowly, but I don't know, uh, thoughtfully to UX designer. And now I'm a design lead to an almost 25 people team in Guayaquil, Ecuador. So the path has been interesting, it's been challenging, and it's been, I don't know, really, really cool to cross uh, and to meet different people, to gain different expertise, I don't know. It's been awesome, really. <laughs> so it's now a pleasure to, to share everything with you and through this platform and through everything UXL is doing to help us design leads and designers grow and evolve in this constantly changing world. So I don't know. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Cool. So to kick it off, there is a, quite an interesting story that you actually shared with us, which is that you have transitioned from graphic designer to UX. How did the process actually look like? Because this can be quite challenging. Yeah. Um, well, I always consider myself not as much as a graphic designer as everyone else, because I wasn't that into drawing and, and colors, but I I was always more interested about information, about what was behind the concept, what was behind, I don't know, the, the book I had to design in editorial design or, uh, or a concept I have to draw for, for a logo or whatever. So as, as I start like growing as a designer, I start facing different challenges and I start noticing how relevant information is and what is behind the, the design you are trying to produce. So I started facing uh, different different projects. And when I met up with website, um, my first website was like, hey, this is like a different and um, more fun way to do editorial design because you can change stuff, you can add stuff, you can like have different interactions in it. So that's what, that's what brought me like more to this digital world in from like becoming to, from graphic designer that's more like static or more I don't know like in the physical world to the digital world and so that's how I slowly progressed to working on websites on digital products and then I realized I was already designing um, flow charts and I was designing interactions. And at the beginning, I didn't know how it was called that I didn't even know that it had a name. So I remember myself like looking for best ways to design a menu. I don't know, for example, a, a drop down menu or, or something. And something took me to the UX path and said that in UX, you learn how to design very interactions and how to manage information differently in the in the this digital world. And so it was like, hey, am I a UX designer now? Am I am I doing this? Like, is this my life now? So it was like real fun and, and real like natural because I always lean into I always lead into that world. But yeah, I found myself doing it and, and I was like really glad I found out that it had a name, it had a structure, it had some courses I could take to like, I don't know, put like an order to everything I was doing and to finally call myself a UX designer. <laughs> cool, awesome. So uh, you joined and you transitioned when you joined the Bank of Guayaquil, which is basically like the fourth biggest bank in Ecuador. So how did your process actually look like when you started preparing for this transition? Because like getting from graphic designer, switching into UX, joining the fourth biggest digital bank in, in a country is kind of a challenge. So yes. how was your process when you take a step back and when you actually see it now from your perspective? Well, uh, I... As I was like really curious and really trying to learn something else, something more related to the project I was doing, that's how I got into UX. And because I was learning so much, I started like mentoring some other people that was around me. And so suddenly I had a, a co-UX designer that was slightly uh, less experienced than I was. And so we started sharing. I started uh, sharing how to 
uh, understand interactions, how to learn more about uh, components and how to learn how a better way to translate from, I don't know, a website to a mobile device, et cetera. And so I found myself mentoring different designers uh, along the way uh, through different projects. And that's how I got into leading little by little, you know, like first I had one mentee and it was like a really good path and she grew, she grew a lot. She's now working in England or something. <laughs> so that was like my first hand. Then I had another one, then I had a one, another one. And so the people I was working with in, in my other bank in Peru saw that potential and they told me like, hey, don't you want to be like a chapter lead? Don't you have... Don't you want to have like a leader team, like a small team to lead? And I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Like if I can, if I can mentor one person, maybe I can mentor like three, four. It got to a point where they were 10 and I was like getting nuts because everyone was like so different and they have different levels of expertise. So you had to really get to know them to see how you can help them, you know, how you can like share their path and be with them every step of the way. So, because of course, as a chapter lead, you don't want them to fail or you don't want them to, to I don't know, to give up bad design or something. So you have to like be really close to them. And that's how I like slowly progress, but always in the UX path. I mean, I always been interested in UI, like in research. I've always been really curious. So if I had a, a, a researcher next to me that had to like research something, I'll, I would go with him. I would ask him, how you do it? Which processor are you, which methodologies are you using? Like I've always been really, really curious. So I always learn as much as I could from different areas. But as a lead, I was always working with UX designers. So I guess like the biggest challenge when they told me to come here to Ecuador to lead a, a whole design team, not only of UX designers, but also UIs, content, and graphic design, and also researchers was like, okay, so now I have to put everything in order. So I have to work even more closely with them because they have different responsibilities. Like we have to work on their technical skills with their, I don't know, even in their human skills, which are really different from the researchers, to the UIs, I don't know. So having to like organize all that information and all that experience and knowledge, uh, I guess that's been the, the hardest one, yeah. <laughs> cool. So with this in mind, I would like really to dig into this topic because at the moment, Actually, like a two months ago, I was chatting and I was having interviews, not like interviews, but basically coffee chats via Zoom uh, with design leaders all over the world. And one of the things that I saw that they have in common was that they had a really hard time balancing design leading and being team managers uh, with actual design work. So yeah. how are you? balancing design leading versus doing actual design work and are there any like tips trick tricks or any secret sauce that you can maybe share with us how am i doing it um well i have to i have to learn a lot on how to like not keep all the responsibilities to myself like to learn that i have a team because they are great designers and they can share some of the some of the team responsibilities also. You know, at the beginning, I didn't have like a design ops person who was in charge of all these different roles. Oh, I didn't have, I didn't have um, chapter leads that could help me like identify specific things for each role. And so I had to create these, these persons with these special responsibilities on the team so I can delegate with them and I can co-work with them, which is hard, you know, when you're like used to doing everything yourself and as US, UX designers, we're really used to being in the middle of the conversation and knowing everything, like being everywhere. Like you have to work with the development team, you have to work with the business, you have to even get outside and I don't know, with, with other areas or with different users. So you have to know everything. And now that I'm a leader, 
that's the first thing I had to realize that maybe I'm not going to know everything because I have to work with my team and I have to like support them and at the same time they can support me. So that's been one of the biggest challenges to get into that pace of not doing everything myself, but like sharing. And that also helps them to grow, you know, because you present them with different challenges and you start like realizing that some people that have this leading potential and so they are like better chapter leads in their role than I could be like managing the whole team at the same time being uh, a role lead. So like working like that has been amazing. And my team has like took the opportunity and they are like constantly asking like, what else can we do? How, how else can we help you? And so that's that's been amazing in this team. And one trick I can share with you all is to manage your agenda, like keep it really close to your heart and like keep it updated every time because you can like set boundaries and at the same time you can like manage better your time and how much effort you're gonna put in every project you've got and how much attention you, you have to put to all your team, you know, to get these personal discussions, to get to know them, to work with them, to check, and validate if the processes are working. I don't know, everything you gotta be like in knowing from and receiving from your team. Um, so if you keep your agenda really close and you manage it well enough, you can find and put everything in place. Um, that helps a lot, really. <laughs> awesome, cool. So you also mentioned that you are physically working with let's call them like internal stakeholders, AKA you're working with developers, you're working with marketing team. Also like with a product, you really need to have like a good thing to work with them. And yes. at some organizations, designers are actually facing, I wouldn't call them problems, but technically let's call them minor challenges when it comes <laughs> yeah. to communicating the idea to development teams so you can actually move faster. Uh, with this in mind, do you maybe have any strategies or maybe again, some secret sauce when it <laughs> comes to getting a buy-in from your internal stakeholders so you as a whole organization can move a bit faster? Um, well, something that's been working really well in team, um, we changed the way we talked about design and process. I mean, it, the idea came from LinkedIn, actually. I was I was seeing all these posts that talk about, like, when you design your portfolio, you should start with the results. You should start with how it impacted the business or what results did, it, did you bring to the table? What value did you bring to the table as a designer from whichever role you were in? And so I told my team, hey, what if we start like that in conversations? What if we start telling them, what value can we bring to the project and then work our way through um, which process we're going to have to have to do, how much time we're going to need, which tools we're going to be using, et cetera, et cetera. And because when we started the other way around, when we started with processes and methodologies, they didn't really understood because they weren't designers, you know, and it's really hard to talk technical to someone that is not technical. And so when you talk about amazing tools, like, I don't know, Figma, Maze, and I don't know, every everything you can learn with them, maybe they don't really get it, you know, because you're not talking about, I don't know, Excel and numbers, which are things that they have on their mind. So when we switch that conversation and start talking about value, and we start talking about um, specific things that we can bring to the project to make it better and to collaborate with them, that's when they started like paying attention, I guess, and giving us more time. And suddenly they also realized that, hey, I got some ideas that are designs. I don't know, it's really fun because they don't know how to put it into words, but they're like, hey, maybe we can like, I don't know, do a focus group in Latin America. It's so common that everyone wants to do a focus group. And they also say, they always say like, hey, let's do a focus group to see if these work. And hey, let's get to, I don't know, let's go to the streets to see if they're using our app or I don't know, they start getting their own ideas. And so you have to like take them, channel channel them and put them into like a, a correct process or with the correct methodologies. But um, like 
when that uh, when you get to that point when you realize that you have sparked that interest and that they start thinking about design that's the point when you realize like hey this synchronization this getting them into the process is, is working cool so what i understood is that you as a chapter lead are basically working with and your team actually has different roles like ux research ux designer design ops etc mm -hmm. and also one of the fun things is that your design team is also multicultural so building a design culture that mm -hmm. actually has people that come from different cultures can be a challenge for itself so how did you actually start building the design culture that you actually saw the best fit for the company and for your team? Yeah, it's it's really challenging. Like, but at the same time, it's really rich because everyone brings different different expertise or different points of view to the conversation. So I guess something that's worked really, really well, it's having two different like spaces for the team one that is like really technical and so we we call it like the design review session we have it like once a week and it's as i tell you it's like really technical and we give like specific feedback on on a user flow or some screens or we work through some components and we put everyone in it like we don't separate only the UIs and the UX because we're working on a special component and the content and the researchers are not in. No, we put everyone together. It doesn't matter if it's your role or if you really know all the specifications, but as a researcher, you've seen people use this component in your life. As a content designer, you have to write for that component or keep that component in, in mind when you're, I don't know, like, writing some content on the screen or guiding a user through how to use it. So it's really valuable to create those spaces, technical spaces with everyone where everyone can join and to keep it, I don't know, light and fun and really engaging. It's really, really important. We don't want it to be like a lecture where someone just stands up and starts talking or starts presenting and everyone just claps at the end. No, it's, we want to keep the conversation rolling. So there are a lot of post-its, there are a lot of emojis, there are a lot of, I don't know, like ch grab your pencil and start writing on the screen because that's where the creativity and ideas flow easier. So for the technical part, that's been helping a lot. So bringing everyone together and also in, in the culture and more on the people side of things, we have this meeting every Friday, it's called like Design Friday, not the most creative name, but it's Design Friday anyway. And it's really, really fun, you know, it's just an open space where one people of the team is in charge of it every week. And also some other people are not designers, like we bring them to the, to the meeting and we set up um, a whiteboard and we started like talking about something that they love, you know, that person in charge are sharing, I don't know if they have five cats. Hey, let's talk about cats the whole meeting. And so we can share like different aspects or maybe someone will say, no, I'm more of a dog person. And then we have the conversation rolling. We also integrate a little about what am I working on. So if I'm working about, I don't know, some experience to buy, I don't know, a safety check for your pets, that's how you relate it to the cats topic and you keep the conversation going that way. But it's like real fun. And it's got to the point where if, for example, once I had a meeting and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to have to cancel the Design Friday because I'm not going to be able to to be a facilitator and to keep the conversation going. Some other people of the team hey, said, hey, don't worry about it, we got it. I mean, and they just came up with a theme in five minutes and they created the meeting because they value it so much. I mean, it's the only time they can have fun and they can share from this like cultural, uh, from this personal perspective, you know? So I guess those both sides, have keep the uh, the team together. Have keep them sharing experiences, like cultural experiences, like technical experiences, and it's it's tons of fun actually. <laughs> it helps awesome. a lot. Yep, cool. So 
with this in mind, when it comes to these kind of rituals that you have as like design team, one of the things that you also did that I really admired of how you did it is that you actually implemented on these Design Fridays where you praise people that are actually learning. Oof, and yes. just to give just to give it the context behind it, what we usually saw is that I can actually relate to myself, even though that I'm product marketer, not like designer per se, uh, but having courses on Coursera, uh, Udemy, Skillshare, etc. I basically have access to at the moment over 10 courses and mm-hmm. I only completed one. And the problem is that I don't have time. And this is kind of similar thing that is happening with designers is that it is really hard implementing learning with and fitting actually learning into the busy schedules that designers have. Yeah. You actually did this. And I think it would be really good to share how you actually implemented learning and how are you actually motivating your your team members and your team to actually consistently improve themselves through this continuous learning and actually sharing the learnings that I actually got from, from the learning materials. Cool. Uh, the fun thing is that I don't have to do anything at all. They do it themselves. <laughs> the thing is that when I started as a design lead, uh, because I had like all the different roles and everything, I didn't have like time enough to they start like setting up well the technical skills, which courses specifically. And so I instantly thought of UXL. I've already been UXL using UXL by myself for some time before. And so I was like, I told my boss, hey, can we like incorporate this tool to our everyday life? Like they have these really small courses you can take every day. It's not gonna be a uh, huge meeting on the agenda, but it's going to be like little times and everyone's agenda they can do every day. They can do, well, their wait for a meeting or I don't know, in their, I don't know, in their creativity break, hey, I'm going to hop on UXL and, and check something there. He actually liked the idea a lot. Um, and so I brought it to the team. We we got everyone a seat. Uh, I started telling them, hey, let's do the... Um, the skill test so we know exactly where we are and how we can develop our skills in a more personal way. And I love that about UXL that you can see specifically which areas are more developed and which areas you can like improve even even faster, even in a more focused way. Because uh, we were talking before, sometimes designers don't know how to continue learning or how to continue growing or how to even start. I mean, I remember my research team telling me, hey, but I don't know anything about UI. I don't know anything about colors. I'm going to fail so bad in that area. And I was like, hey, but that's the point, you know, let's check out what you know, what you like, and let's potentiate all those skills from there. And so that's that's also something really cool about UX is that you have different, different topics and different levels. So for my research team, it was like, hey, hop into the basics of design, check color theory, check typography, check, I don't know, design patterns or something in the basic stuff. So then you can progress and understand better how UI designers are creating components. (laughs) Because at the beginning, of course, they were like, what the hell is a drop down, you know? (laughs) But now they are getting more into it and combining all that learning with all these sessions, all these design sessions where we have to technically speak about like specific design topics. So they merge together really, really nicely. And I said, I didn't have to do anything because once uh, we got UXL into the team, everyone knew which skills they wanted to improve and everything else. They start having competitions by themselves. Like sometimes we got in the WhatsApp at I don't know 10, 11 p.m. in the morning, and they were three people like challenging each other and sharing. Hey, I got this much score, and and because of Design Fridays, we're sharing like the top three of the week. People like fought really, really hard to get to that top three. And so I was only like laying on my bed, like eating some com- some popcorn, looking at them, like challenge themselves. It was, it's really, really fun. And at the same time, it keeps them motivated. So as I told you, I didn't have to do anything. I only brought UX to the table. And then that's where all the magic 
begun. I mean, and it's really cool. And because now we are like setting the team up, up to certifications because we have certifications now and we have this design path so i'm like hey you gotta get your certifications fight for it i mean the people that get the first certifications are gonna have like i don't know another kind of prize or whatever and so we keep it fun we keep it light we keep it like challenging and motivating and yes it's been amazing and which is also really really cool about it is how it translates to the conversation the design team has now with other other team members. I mean, they're speaking in more technical ways. They're bringing some aspects that they've learned in the course to the conversation, and you can you can like almost feel it. Like they're talking about I don't know accessibility. They're talking about the you hear the researchers talk about color color use or typography and it's like oh my god I didn't know you could do that you know but now you got it and you bring it to a conversation and it's really really nice awesome cool well basically just to add on this point uh Adam Moseris of the, the OG founder of Instagram uh he likes to call these problems basically champagne problems like hey I'm laying <laughs> in my bed I have my teammates competing who is going to learn so this is fun but Alessia here sent us a one trick question, let's call it like that, or just want to add Ooh. some twist to this. So it is always good to like to kind of persuade designers that they need to stay up to, up to date with the design, with lessons, with all the things that are changes, even with technology, like Figma released a bunch of new features and they're basically on a rampage with new features every week. Yes. But in the end, there is quite a different challenge for design leaders, which is persuading the boss or someone that is above you that like to invest money, time, resources into mm -hmm. systematic team learning. So from your experience, uh, how would how did you persuade your C levels or whoever is above you within your within your team structure to actually invest and to invest the resources on so not just money but time, other resources that you have into implementing this type of systematic learning? Oof, nice question. Um in my team, I guess I had like something, uh, something specific that made it that uh, that pitch a little easier, because I have like different aspects in culture. Like I have people from different uh, parts of Latin America. I have like people bringing different uh, roles to the table, but I have also different levels of expertise. So. I use that to to pitch something as UXO to my boss and tell him, hey, you know how this person has all the, I don't know, huge projects, the big responsibilities, you know how he's bringing all this technical stuff to the table. How about we use this tool to help everyone else get to that point, you know, and also leverage this, this senior designer, but like, because I used this example of how the senior was using all his skills, it was easier for me to pitch like the different levels I had on my team and how this tool would help us really easily, like through these challenges or through this, like, I don't know, like team motivation um, to get there, you know? And, and so he saw it really quickly because it was obvious that if you have like not that many seniors in your team, they are in charge of the most complex projects. Of course, they have to take like the more difficult decisions. Um, when you when you improve the level of the team and when you help them uh, grow and have all these new tools uh, from the side of knowledge that they can implement directly to their projects, they start getting like more anxious and they they also get motivated. And so. They are even the ones that started saying like, hey, yeah, can we have it? Like, hey, I've seen this course. I really want to take it. Can we have it? So it's not only my push, but also the whole team uh, showing the boss that they want to learn, that they want to improve, that they want to use these skills in their projects. And so I guess as in everything, if it's a collaborative, if it's a team effort, it works better. So... I would recommend them to keep them on board, to keep them in the conversation, to work with them 
through this um, learning plan that you're going to implement and have their feedback and have their ideas and show the boss that that is not only your idea as a leader, but is a motivation of the whole team that works nicely. <laughs> awesome. Great. So wrap slowly this section up before we jump to the questions from, from the audience here. Uh, you had some amazing rituals that you just shared with us that you implemented when you started building design team culture. So if we take a look at the input and output, so you had to input a lot of your time, a lot of your resources to actually deliver this and to build a top-notch design team. In the end, how did it actually impact the entire business and your team, but specifically in two ways? First one, how did it impact the outputs that your team members were actually bringing to the table? Mm -hmm. And the second one is how did these rituals and how did learning impact uh, the retention and satisfaction of your employees? Nice. Well, in, in the terms of the output, you can, uh, as I was telling before, you can almost feel it in the conversation, what, what else they're bringing to the table. And it's really nice to see how people are growing and evolving and like taking more risks or being able to say, hey, I want to take that challenge. I know I don't know anything about this, but I want to learn. I want to get into it. I promise I can make it. I mean, I have got people telling me, like, I promise I can make it. Please trust me. Please, I want to participate in this. And so having that enthusiasm from their part, it's a lot. And that shows, you know, you can you cannot have anyone better that someone that is motivated, that wants to learn, that wants to participate, that it's amazing on the team. Of course, maybe not everyone's going to have like the same level of energy or motivation, but when you got them, it's amazing. And the, the coolest part of it is that it's contagious and it shows, you know, and it's easily, it's really easy to spot when someone's like really proud of themselves and really motivated to do more and to collaborate. Um, also, you can see it on the design on the user experience they bring um, on the conversations they have, on the feedback they provide. I mean, the level is completely like high rise. And, and because we invite other people, not only designers, but maybe business people, maybe developers, maybe some other managers to the conversations we have, like uh, we invite, we even invite them to the design reviews. And so they're like, hey, what am I gonna bring to the table? Hey, it doesn't matter, but you know the process, you know the product, let's just collaborate and keep the conversation going. And so that's also how we show them, hey, we're learning new things, we're implementing new things. Um, and they notice, they really notice. And, it, and it's really cool because you start noticing also how other areas, they reach to you and they tell you, hey, I've seen that you are working on this product. I've seen your design team asking questions to this other team I'm working with. I want to be there. I want to participate. May or maybe you can help me do this other product better. And that's really, that's really amazing. And I bring this these questions from other areas to the team and I tell them like openly hey we got this opportunity to participate with I don't know with the legal team they want to design something with us who want to go who want to get there and so they they put themselves up to the challenge and some people know something about it some people have experience some people doesn't have an experience at all but they are up to it and so that's how you you can like I don't know, that's how it shows how the, the team is evolving and how much value, how much more value we're bringing to the table. And related to the other question about retention and also, I guess, adoption of, of new design, designers in the team, we've grown, like we're, uh, I've doubled the number of designers in the team uh, throughout the year I've been at the bank. It's been amazing and um, not only grown like in the number of team members, but also in the level of the team members. Like they have uh, rises, they, they like taken different challenges. Um, some of them are POs of their own projects. And that's not something that happens constantly. Like I haven't seen it that 
regularly that a designer takes the leading role in a project. And so that also shows how important the, the team is and the value they bring to the table. And the retention, it, it shows, I mean, they want to participate. They want to do more. They want to challenge themselves. They want to learn new things. And that's that's what keeps the, the team growing and, and going, I guess, because it never feels, I don't know, stuck or boring. Um, you're never doing the same thing over and over and over. You're always challenging and bringing something new to the table. And that's helped a lot to the team. So because they value that, they value that. They're, they know they're going to keep on growing through different paths. And so I've got people telling me, hey, uh, I got this proposal from this other bank or this other job opportunity, but I know I can do more here. So I want to do more here. I want to like take another challenge or participate in, with another area or I don't know, even do more research if I am a UX designer or if I'm a content designer. Hey, I want to know more about components. And so I guess that helped a lot uh, in retaining and, and growing. Great. Awesome. To digress with one question, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you previously worked uh, for one bank in Peru mm -hmm. and now you're working for a bank in Ecuador. So you actually transitioned and moved from Peru to Ecuador. So I got a question that might sound interesting and that might seem interesting to, to other people as well. So you actually did not just transition from graphic designer to UX, but you also transitioned from a whole different country to another. What yes. was the opportunity cost that you had to take and that you actually faced uh, when actually moving to a different country to pursue your career? Well, uh, I guess for me, it was, it was not a hard decision, actually. Uh, I always wanted to visit other countries. I always, I love traveling. And so when I got the opportunity to get to a new country, to understand a new culture, to live there, it was like, hey, yeah, I want to do this. Of course, I had to measure like all the things I was leaving behind in Peru. Uh, but at the same time, I guess I was really comfortable in Peru. Uh, I had like my family, my friends and my home and, and my job at this huge bank, amazing bank that helped me grow in so much. But I was comfortable there. Like I, I felt like I had already managed to get everything in track. Of course, some days uh, something like someone started a fire somewhere and you had to run like usually, but um, but I felt really comfortable, you know? And it's not that I didn't like that, but that made it really easy to decide to take this opportunity, to grab my things, like to grab my clothes, because that's all I had to, <laughs> I, I could bring to a, to a new country, and to grab my clothes, to grab my boyfriend and my cats and say, hey, let's go to another place and, and start all over. You know, um, of course, it's been sad at the beginning. Of course, I cried. <laughs> of course, it's been kind of hard making new friends. But the people has been so welcoming here. Like the team has been amazing. My boss has given me all the support I needed. Like the bank has given me all the support I I needed. And because the challenges are where where and still are so big and so constant and so different, that, that's helped me a lot because I'm constantly distracted and constantly designing new ways to get through something. Um, constantly like learning myself uh, as a new leader, how to be a better leader, how to manage people, how to incorporate uh, technical skills with the soft skills, which is really important, and how to deal with other areas in different culture how to not use these catchphrases I used to use in Peru that no one understands here and learning some new catchphrases and like tropicalizing my language also. <laughs> I don't know. Everything's different yeah. and everything's excited and I'm easily surprisable. I don't know. I'm, I like new things. I like new challenges. So yeah, it. 
I had to I had to leave a lot of comfort behind, but it led me to design a new life here. So it's it's been amazing and it still is. Awesome. Cool. So right now we're going to focus more on attendee questions and cool. people that are actually present here and that sent us the questions before the webinar starts. So just want to remind one more time, everyone who's participating, feel free to shoot your questions in the Q&A section. We're going to try our best to answer the, as much as we can because we already have in total around 20 questions. So we're going to do this as better as possible. So the first question that came through the sign up form when people are were actually signing up for the webinar mm -hmm. uh, is basically this this is how the question goes. So what steps would you recommend uh, to some, uh, basically to me, uh, what, what steps uh, would you recommend me to take in order to bring a more design-driven culture in a team where I'm the first designer they work with? Ooh, first designer. Hey, that's a nice and also really challenging place to be. <laughs> I I like the uh, I like the first designer concept because we get you you get to work with everyone else like you have to work with everyone else and that will be my recommendation to bring everyone to your process to incorporate everyone into your thought process and to every decision you make so they start learning or hearing design things or uh, design languages or design technicalities and they get more used to it and they start understanding and also they feel they start feeling considered, you know, something I had to go through is that as a control freak designer, I want to do everything myself as I wanted to do it. But everyone else on the team got lost in the process because I was only focused on my work and I presented amazing designs at the end, but they didn't understand how I got there. And so the value wasn't the same as when I started like working with them, uh, working more collaboratively, working more in like in workshops, like opening my process to them, showing them how to do it, of course, because they don't really know how to put, I don't know, component A with B together, but like showing them those uh, little steps, like incorporating them in, in all the process, um, that's what bring the team together and helps you to like position design in, in a place and like help them realize which parts of, of the process or which parts of the solution can be managed through some design piece that you're bringing to the table as the only designer. Awesome, cool. So here's a question from Cecilia. Uh, how do you show technical knowledge to stakeholders or even hiring managers without having it going over their heads? <laughs> mm, translating it in terms they actually understand, <laughs> which is really hard because you cannot talk about, I don't know, like components on their own terms or interactions. You cannot talk about heuristics or things that for us are so natural. You have to like, put it in a way that they understand. And something that works really nicely is when I translate my like design talk into the user's talk. And because you are user experience designers, everything should be related on how the user is gonna use it or what value we're bringing to the user. So when you stop talking about design technologies and start talking about how the user is gonna feel better or accomplish a task or feel satisfied after using your product, that's when everyone else, designer or not, get the value you're bringing. Um, so it's it's kind of hard sometimes because, some, of course, you know that if you talk about, I don't know, as I said, maybe some heuristics, you're going to like prove them that everything's right and that everything's like well designed and, and stuff. but if you translate it to that point of view, they're gonna value it even more. Awesome. Uh, another question for Morteza. Uh, what are the core qualities you wished you achieved sooner before starting a leadership role? Wow. Um, 
being able to open myself to other team members, designers or, or not, I guess related to my last, the last answer I gave. Uh, I used to produce really fast. Uh, I used to like accomplish every task really easily, but I was totally disconnected. So if I knew sooner that incorporating all my team members into my process would give me even more value and would get us as product um, developers to create a better product, I would have started sooner. Uh, I would have like developed maybe my soft skills a little more, more communication skills, more understanding skills, more empathy towards my team, not only to my user. Those, those traits will have helped me a lot. Awesome, great. So a few minutes ago, you also mentioned that you have some designers that are POs as well, which actually is a quite good segue into this next question that was asked. So from your opinion and from your experience, do you think that actually what is more efficient to assign responsibilities based on a task or based on a project? On a task or on a product? Yeah, or on a project level. So should someone oh. be responsible on a project level or should some designers or team, uh, should they be responsible for a certain task? I would always push for being responsible for the project because when you focus only on a task, you can, you can like, check the task really easily. You can like get to a solution really easily. But if you don't understand like the whole concept or if you don't understand why they want to get that task done, you're losing some important details on the process. Again, we are user experience designers. We should know more than just how the drop downs drop. You know, we should know everything that involves this requirement, everything that is going to bring to the table as as one task as part of the whole product, and it gives you a different perspective. It gives you, it it helps you to participate uh, even better in the important conversations. Even maybe that task that you were about to accomplish wasn't the right one, and that always happens in design. Like some POs or some managers come, they tell you, "Hey, I want you to fix this like in this way." But you as a designer know that maybe that's not the best way to do it. But if you only focus on the task, you lose all that other like contextual knowledge that can help you even bring more value or present a different way, better solution. So try always to focus on everything else and then work on the task. Awesome, cool. So usually like every team has and actually might have some smaller issues that they're facing internally mm -hmm. that might not actually go on the surface so do you maybe have any best practices that you can share to like how you can detect and how you can actually find these smaller issues within the team and potentially fix it Oof, they're really important because those smaller issues they always translate to bigger things. And if you don't pay attention to them or if you don't work with them, as soon as you realize they're there, they may have like an extreme potential you didn't want them to achieve to. So how to, how to understand them better? I guess working with people really closely is really important on a team. And getting to know them, uh, give them, a space to to be themselves to propose to be creative um to share also those times when they don't know what to do <laughs> i mean when they have problems when they have not also blockers but maybe uncertainties with themselves with their own designs and with their own ideas like giving them the space to say hey i'm not sure about this or hey i need help with this that's that's a really important part because you create that safe space and that's where you as a leader or maybe your own chapter leads can identify, hey, maybe you need to learn a little bit more about this technical aspect or maybe we need to work some more on how you propose your ideas to the team or I don't know, leader issues that can uh, can 
evolve. And so I guess, yeah, working like really closely with them and giving them the space to be themselves, and not to be afraid to to ask for help, basically. Uh, that's a nice way to, to do it. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So imagine that you are the only UX person on board. Maybe okay. you you actually was that in the past. So how would you convince your stakeholders to bring more design people into your team when you're actually the one-man army at the moment? <laughs> That's nice. Uh, this tip also works for bigger teams. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're one one person army or if you are 20 person army. Uh, the fact that managers or maybe POs don't have the complete vision or visibility of all your responsibilities as a designer, of all the tasks you have to accomplish, of all the little steps you have to go through to get to the end point of the design. Um, that's mostly what keeps this, I don't know, underperforming team or where you can like argue or ask for more help, you know? So having, having implemented the use of Kanban with Agile or with some tools or maybe just some post-its on the wall. Like it doesn't matter how high or low fidelity your task managing system is, but the important part is giving, giving the team that visibility of everything you have to go through and showing them that, hey, maybe if someone else can help me with the research part, I can keep on focusing on developing the screens or the interactions, you know? Maybe if someone helps me with the design system and can manage all the components, I can be more productive by thinking about the unhappy paths or alternative paths while using the components from the library and not having to go through every button every time I have to uh, design something new. Um, and so only like giving that visibility that's how they're gonna understand how much you gotta do and how you can like disintegrate that process into many, a lot of people, different tasks and not only one people task. Awesome, cool. So one question is if you, if we can go back in time when you just transitioned from graphic design to UX, do you think you would do something differently compared to that period if you had the knowledge that you have today? Well, I would have, I would not have learned, uh, I would not have, I would not have gone to the graphic design path. I would have gone straight to the user experience design path. Um, yeah, because, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I have this internal conflict, but because now I realize that everything I learned through the, my design graphic design classes, I'm applying now as a designer. Uh, they they helped me a lot to see detail differently, to understand, I don't know, user experience processes differently, to manage information differently. And so, I mean, maybe I would have gone uh, faster into the user experience path but maybe I wouldn't have changed that like basic career of graphic design and everything that brought to the table. Yeah, maybe keep the keep the learning process going faster so I can get to the technical user experience part easily. Um, but yeah, maybe not changing the past. Maybe working over it, yes. <laughs> oh, so we have a question from Daniel. I'm in here as well is, and the question is, what is the usual process that you adopt to help a new team member in your design team to build creative approach or creativity as a skill? Hmm. What process are we using? Mm, for new team members, I always try to not leave them alone. Like something that's that's helped a lot in, in every team I've been on. Also, when I when I got to my first team, I was never alone. I always had a mentor. I always had someone else that come that could join on my on my path of working through a project or I don't know doing whatever thing I needed to do to get done. 
that way I like I can open myself or this new designer can open himself and to be allow himself to be more creative and to explore more ideas because he knows that he has that support next to him that he's not alone and so that helps pushing and that helps like bringing and collaborating more easily and that gives them like a good foundation so suddenly you realize hey they are ready to do things on their own and maybe to be the mentor of someone else and that's how you keep them like growing and you give them the free space to like I don't know start start designing freely um start creating and start improving yeah Awesome, cool. And we are almost at Oof. time. So we have one more question, last that we can actually squeeze it in. Cool. Imagine that you have to hire a either mid, mid or senior designer that needs to join your team. Mm -hmm. From your opinion and from your experience, what, is, what would be a single most important skill that you would look into a candidate that actually is a meteor or senior designer, whether if it is technical or soft skill. Mm -hmm. What am I looking for? Um, mostly with seniors, I'm looking for motivation because sometimes I've come across seniors that think that they already know everything or that they already been through every challenge they could get. So everything's like easy or they already have all the experience they need. Um, I don't know, that's, I, I don't feel that's the best way to approach a new team and a new challenge because you have to be open to learn more and to maybe collapse everything you've experienced before and build again something different from it. So I guess that motivation and that willingness to to learn and to participate and, and to grow even more, even if you're a designer, a 10 years experience designer, I don't know. Um, that's what I'm looking for. And for a medium designer, also, I guess in every in every level, I'm looking for that willingness to do more, to learn more, to be challenged. I'm recruiting researchers now, and researchers, experienced researchers here in Guayaquil, is kind of dif are kind of difficult to find, and so I'm looking more for like that motivation and inspiration, that willing to to learn and to help. Of course, they're gonna have to be like more focused. Um, on the user, if they're a researcher, more focus on the content. If they are like UX writer, more focus on the screens and the interactions. If they are UX UI, like that's those are like the basics. But if they are willing to learn and they are eager to participate and to collaborate and to bring something to the table, that's what I appreciate more when I'm recruiting. Awesome, great. So that's it for this webinar. We need to slowly wrap it up because we're here for one hour and one minute yes. officially since we started. <laughs> so nice. everyone, thank you for your time. Thank you for actually being thank here with so us much. and sticking here with us. Eliana, thank you again for sharing these awesome nuggets with us and sharing your experience that you actually faced and how you actually tackled uh, some of the challenges and all the strategies that you implemented. It is like, from my point of view, it is truly valuable. And I hope that you guys that are attending have also seen the value in this. So yeah, Eliana actually just sent you her LinkedIn profile. So feel free to connect with mm -hmm. her. Yes. Uh, also, what I wanted to show to tell you one once more, just to remind you is that we're going to, uh, we're actually recording this webinar. We're going to post it on our YouTube channel and we're going to send it over to you so you can actually share it with your team, rewatch it or share it anywhere if you think that this can be valuable to other folks as well. Uh, and also if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for the next topic that we can cover on the webinar that could be suitable for you or could be helpful, feel free to reach out to me personally, either on LinkedIn or via email, and we'll do our best to actually help you and support you with it. So once again, thank you for your time. Eliana, thank you for joining. And thank guys, you see you on the next webinar as well. Have see fun you on the next and one. have a great evening. Cheers. You too.